Hi everyone, John Pokertrip Friedberg here with another episode of Stacking Chips, your strategy source for the 2007 World Series of Poker, the Bellagio Cup, and the dozens of other events going on right here in lovely Las Vegas. Today is Thursday and it's the start of day three of the main event of the World Series of Poker. And um, there's I think about 800 or so players remaining. They're paying like just over 600 or right around 600. So um, they should be in the money here very shortly. And uh, my guest today actually is another a very big name in the online world. He's still in the main event and uh, he's, he's doing pretty well. So we're going to have him on the show here momentarily. Uh, but before that, I want to get to a couple email questions. And uh, like I said, we have lots of questions that have come in. I'm going to try my best to address all of these questions before the World Series is over. But uh, let's get right to it. I got three or four for you right now. The first question comes from Gordon. Gordon writes, hello, John. I've been enjoying your interviews on cardplayer.com. I was wondering if you offer one-on-one online coaching. I'm a budding player under the online name, I won't mention his name, looking to improve my game. Thanks. Well, I've actually been approached by a lot of people about that. And, um, you know, I've done some mentoring in the past. I've done some coaching. Um, but I, I don't know, really. I, you know, I've been actually approached about creating some, site, some sort of training site. I've talked to a couple of the training sites about being like a, a pro on their site. So I don't really know. But um, quite honestly, coaching takes up a lot of time. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to be fairly compensated for that time, if that makes sense, because, you know, if you, if you look at an hourly rate, like it, it really, it just takes up a lot of time and I don't have a whole lot of time. So I, I'm leaning towards probably not interested in one-on-one coaching, but that said, you know, I, I might make an exception. I don't really know, but uh, uh, follow up with me on that one and, and we'll see. And, and stay tuned to the show and um, keep in touch with me through my website or my MySpace page and um, I will let you know if I'm going to do any coaching or joining any training sites, etc., etc. So thanks for that question, Gordon. We'll see about that one. Next question comes from Tony. Tony writes, Hi John, great show. I've watched everyone so far. Absolutely the best. Thank you, Tony. Also met you at the World Series this year for during the first week. I said hello and you're very polite and forthcoming and just being very hospitable hospitable. Thank you very much for that. My hopefully not stupid question is, are there an assortment of games at the World Series besides just Hold'em? There's Stud, Omaha, Low Ball, Deuce of Seven, Horse, and the Split Pot games for Omaha and Stud. Now my understanding of Hold'em is that it's a variation of Seven Card Stud, so can you please address why or has there ever been a Hold'em 8 or better split game? Can it be done or am I missing something very obvious? Thanks in advance and keep up the great work with the show. Um, Hold'em high-low split is actually a game. It's a very uncommon game, but it's certainly a game that can be played. I used to play it in Tucson back in college. We used to play a uh, a pot limit dealer's choice game. I think the blinds were, uh, I don't know, 2 and 5 or 5 and 10 or something. This is back in like 90, 95 or 96 or something. We used to play dealer's choice, pot limit, and the choice of, hand, of games were anywhere from... Uh, Hold'em, Omaha High, Omaha High-Low Split, um, Hold'em High, well I already mentioned Hold'em, but Hold'em High-Low Split, Pineapple, Crazy Pineapple, so we had a lot of fun with that, and uh, one of the more popular games was Hold'em High-Low, it's a fun game, played just like Hold'em, but there's also a low where, with an 8 or better qualifier, which is very similar to Omaha, um, the only difference is you only need one card to play, so if there's a 2, 3, 4, 5 on the board and you have just a, a Ace 9 in your hand, then you still have a wheel. Your ace plays for the low and for the high, of course. Whereas in Omaha, you have to have two low cards to play and two high cards to play. You have to play two cards in your hand in Omaha, only one in Hold'em. Um, so there is a high-low Hold'em. I've never seen it in a World Series game, and it's in fact, I haven't even seen that game played in years, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it showed up on the internet one of these days if it's not already there on one of the sites. But uh, thanks for the question, Tony, and it was nice meeting you. My last question comes from Mike, and Mike writes, Hey John, my name is Mike and I really enjoy your show. You cover a lot of great material and I watch the show almost as if it's a course on poker at times. Anyway, my question concerns pot odds and was actually inspired through one of the other emails sent to you that you covered on the show. Um, this 
is definitely a specific question to tournament strategy as opposed to cash games. Let's say you're in a tournament not yet in the money, but not particularly close to the bubble either. It's the, you're on the turn card and you're holding ace-jack of hearts on an unpaired king-high board with two hearts. You have $8,000 in chips and there's 25 k in the pot with the blinds still a manageable 1 in 200 with a quarter ante. Your opponent is first to act and bets your last, he bets 8000 at you, making the pot 33 k and then accidentally exposes his hand, which is ace-king offsuit. And you now know that your ace is not live and you only have nine outs remaining in the deck. Now with the pot offering you just slightly more than four to one on your money and knowing you are a four to one dog in a tournament, do you make this call for your tournament life? Now there's, there's a few variables to answer this question. I would say if I'm playing online, this is a hundred dollar tournament and I'm also in three or four or five other tournaments, I make this call every time because I'm playing to win, I'm playing to accumulate chips, and if I win this pot with 33 in it, or with actually with 41,000 in chips in the pot, still playing 1 in 200, um, that's a really, really big stack, and I would feel very good in that spot um, for making a final table, at least in <laughs> the final table. Um, if I'm playing in a 10K event, and this is my tournament life, and I still, I still have 40 big blinds, if I fold, I might view this differently. I, I don't know. I really it depends how I'm running. If I'm running good, if I've had a lot of caches lately, I'm probably going to make this call to try to accumulate a monster stack. Um, if things haven't been going well for me, so you know lately, and I'm trying to, uh, you know, maybe a little more anxious to get to the money, I might make the laydown here. So I think this is very much sort of an on the fence situation for a big live event, for a, you know a small to medium sized. Online event, it's a no-brainer. I call this every time. A big live event, it really just depends how I'm running, depends what the stacks are at my table, who's at my table. If um, you know, if I fold them down to 8,000 in chips, what do the other guys have at my at my table? Obviously, one of them's going to have 33, at least. But um, are the other stacks short? Are they great players? Are they weak players? Certainly, if they're weak players, I'm more likely to fold because I know I can chip up through the weaker players. If they're very solid players. With, and they all have big stacks, I'm going to make this call. So it depends on a few things, but I would say for the most part, you know, I'm definitely going to call online. Live, I'm probably a 50-50 depending on my table situation and, of course, how I've been running. All right, so my guest on the show is a very well-known online player. He's had a tremendous year, actually a tremendous last couple of months. He plays under the online name SC Trojans, and his name is Scott Freeman. Now, Scott has had, in the month of May, he had three pocket fives triple crowns, which means three times he won three tournaments in a week with $10,000 minimum prize pools. Uh, That's a huge accomplishment. Nobody's ever done that. Also, two times in May, he final tabled two Sunday major events in the same day. So, a huge accomplishment. He's in the World Series main event right now. He's moving on to day three today with a decent stack Ladies and gentlemen, Scott S.C. Trojans Freeman. Scott, thanks for coming on the show. Thank Glad you. to have you here. Glad to be here. So um, you're going into uh, day three of the main event today. Mm -hmm. You guys are just down to how many players? I think there's somewhere around 800. And they're paying about 590? I think 621 is the exact number. Oh, okay, cool. So how are you doing in chips? Um, I'm sitting at about 181K, which is a, a little bit above average. Um, it's a good stack. I'm a little disappointed. I had about 220 a few hands before we were done for the night, and I lost 40,000 40, with pocket queens uh, to bring it back down to 181, but I'm still feeling pretty good. So what are the blinds right now? Um, we have about an hour left of 1,200, 2,400 before they go up. I'm actually not sure what the next level is, probably something like 1,500, 3,000. Um, but yeah, I've got plenty of play left in my stack, so I'm looking forward to playing today. Well, there, there must be lots of really short stacks, I would imagine, and you guys are really getting close to the bubble here. Yeah. Actually, I looked at my table draw for uh, today, and there's only one player that has me covered, and there's prob like at least five players with about 50, 70, under 75K. So um, when the bubble does come around, I'm going to try to 
uh, I don't want to say abuse the bubble, but I'm going to try to pick up a lot of pots because I know a lot of the players, uh, the players are going to try to be like pulled into cash. So, so you abuse the players. Yes, I guess. I guess <laughs> Take advantage of the bubble by abusing the players. I guess. Good strategy. <laughs> so let's talk about your performance so far in the main event. What like what have been your ending chip counts after days one and obviously we know you're ending day two but how did day one go for you uh day one i like probably the fifth hand of the day i had pocket kings and ended up having to fold um a huge pot to a river all in on a six high board and it dropped me down to about 11k so i was really discouraged i ended up getting down to about 9800 um after like the first level and i don't know after that i just started to chip up chip up chip up um actually ended the ended, ended day one with 115k um, just chipping up and not playing very many big pots. And uh, so I went into day two with 115K, having never played a big pot. And the exact same thing happened day two. I just kept on chipping up, didn't play a single pot over about 40K. Or actually, I played an 80K pot like the last hand before break. But yeah, I just chipped up. Um, didn't try, tried to avoid big pots. Tried to never, actually, I've never had a single pre flop all in, my opponent or myself otherwise. So um, I've just been calling a lot in position with my big hands and playing the small pots, and I uh, eventually got up to 180K. So uh, a lot of a different style to a lot of players that have been playing uh, who like to play the big pots and see their stacks go up and down really big, but mine's been pretty steady to climb all the way up. Now, is that pretty common of your play in general? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, I, play, I try to play pretty mistake-free poker. I don't really like to go out and try to accumulate a ton of chips with playing big pots. I try to keep the pots small and uh, just not make very many mistakes, and I think that's kind of what I've been doing here. Um, the stacks are a lot deeper than they are online, which is where I play mostly, so a lot of the play is more post-flop. So, um, I mean, I, I, I'm not as experienced as a lot of these players playing really deep stacks, but I think I'm doing all right. Um, but yeah, I just try to try to keep the pot small and, and play pretty mistake-free, and uh, it's been doing well for me. Now, a lot of our viewers send me emails with questions about how to accumulate chips, how to chip up. Um, you know, I think a lot of people learn how to play poker by watching TV, by watching final tables, where more often than not, the average stack is only, you know, 10 big blinds or something, mm -hmm. so they're just an all-in fest. Right. So you see a lot of these beginner players, just all they know is all-in. Right. Um, but you obviously are excellent at chipping up and keeping the pot small and sort of, you know, m maintaining the pot size to a comfortable level. Right. Um, what is it, what exactly is your strategy? Like, give us some examples of how you do that. I mean... If it's folded around to you in middle position or late position, what are some of your, you know, ranges of hands as far as raising or calling? Well, to be honest, I do open a decent range of hands. Um, should I try to like pick up the pots or or get a weak call out of the blinds and try to play out, play them post flop. But to give you an example of what I mean, like uh, yesterday, a player in middle position raised, and I was on I think the button with pocket queens, and we were both very deep. And rather than re-raise like most players probably would, pocket queens against like a middle position raise, I decided to just flat call in position and keep the pot small. And the flop came all babies and he fired. Flop came, turn came another baby and he fired again and the river came another baby and I fu he fired again. And I, and I felt like a calling station, but at the same time I was trying to keep the pot small and I ended up paying him off on the river and uh, he flipped up king jack high. So I got max value out of my hand while also keeping the pot small. And I just have tried to not put a ton of chips in the pot pre-flop, unless I obviously have aces or kings. Or something like that, but um, yeah, I I mean I, I just haven't done a lot of re raising at all pre flop, um, and just trying to play my play position a lot. Now I had Sorel in here Imperium, mm -hmm. and um, he liked to explain, or sort of he he explained that his strategy was he likes to take control of every pot that he's in, right? right? So now I I can't obviously speak on his behalf, but from what he was saying, he basically said. If he had those pocket queens, he likes to raise, right? right? He wants to take charge of the pot. Mm -hmm. He wants to find out where he's at in the hand. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I mean, there's obviously two different forms of poker. There's small ball poker where you're really keeping the pot small. Then there's big ball poker where you're really just trying to build these huge pots. <laughs> right. Me and Sorrell, are, I guess our styles are pretty different. Um, I've heard some stories about him re-raising a lot more than I have, and uh, I mean, obviously, it both it, it works both ways. But his stack has been up and down, hundreds of thousands of chips for throughout the last few days, and my stack hasn't moved. So there's definitely a much much different style. But yeah, I don't like to take control, I guess, as much as uh, as Sorrel does. I like to let my opponents feel like they have control of the pot and like 
I mean, I, I, most of my chips have been accumulated from my opponents just trying to bluff me. So, um, I mean, drastically different styles, but obviously both have been fairly successful this World Series. So, uh, hopefully, both of us can uh, remain successful and see each other later in the tournament. Well, you know, Phil Phil Helmuth has also a, a very sort of tight, aggressive type of style mm -hmm. too, where um, you know he doesn't get too crazy. Right. And um, you know, a lot of people trash talk him, and I always have been a, a Helmuth trash talker myself but you know I was I mean first of all he's, he's proven himself 11 times now right. especially last year and this year but I was playing with him in the 1k rebuy and he was really short stack and he kept folding and every now and then he would limp a pot and someone would raise he would fold everyone was giving him crap and he, he just you know he would roll up his sleeve and he'd say you know well you know I, I like to play to win these bracelets um, right. you know you guys can play how you want but I, I like winning these bracelets yeah. <laughs> and he's done it I mean so obviously that type of play is in my opinion, you know, equally as effective right. as crazy play. It's just the difference of, you know, chip accumulation and, you know, where you are going into a final table or something, but doesn't necessarily have an impact on the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I would, I don't want to say I play like, I played like him in this World Series, but I, I from watching him on TV and whatnot, I see he likes to, uh, he doesn't like to build the pot as well, so I, I think I'm playing a little bit like him at this main event. Um, I'm not going to say I, I haven't open limped any pots because I just don't do that. I, op I was open for a raise, but um, yeah, I, I have been trying to play a lot like Phil does in these big events. So, um, and it's worked out for me. So I don't think I'm going to change anything. So you're fairly young. You just turned 21 a few months ago. Right. You don't have too much live experience, but you're you destroy the online tournaments. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned in in my intro that you won 14 tournaments in May, three pocket fives, triple crowns, which no one has ever done before. You had, um, in, in the same month, on two Sundays, you final tabled two of the major events in the same day, twice mm -hmm. in that month. So you've obviously, you have a ton of experience and, you know, incredible skills at the game without a whole lot of live experience. How do you, like, what level of comfort do you have playing live in this deep stack event, the main event here at the World Series? Well, actually, I'm actually fairly comfortable because um, while I haven't played any of the huge, like, live buy-in tournaments, uh, I played so, so, so much live with all my friends and stuff throughout high school. I started really young. I started, I don't know, when I was, like, 15. I'm 21 now, so I've been playing, like, granted, it's not the huge tournaments, but I've been playing live for six years, so I'm really comfortable with my chips. I'm really comfortable sitting at the table. I'm really comfortable interacting with all the players. Um, so actually, I'm, I don't I don't get very nervous when I go to play in these events, which is really fortunate because I do see a ton of the players not really comfortable at the table. Um, but I mean, to be honest, I, I don't feel much different at live than I do online. I'm, I'm really at home. So how about with the bubble? The the bubble payouts or the lowest payouts in the in the World Series main event are about twenty thousand dollars, right. which is usually the first place prize, give or take, in any you know. <laughs> average online tournament yeah. and you know the bubble or the lowest payouts in an online tournament I'm guessing assuming you know in the hundred dollar ones give or take it's you know a couple hundred bucks right. 150 to 300 sometimes 400 dollars what's gonna be I mean obviously you want to go and you said you want to abuse the bubble mm -hmm. but how intimidated are you that you're gonna miss out on a twenty thousand dollar payout compared to what you're used to in the online tournaments well if I told you I wasn't thinking about that I'd be lying so um, it's definitely going to be in my head. I'm definitely, I'm, I'm going to find myself adjusting my game a little bit. It's only natural, um, especially considering the fact that twenty thousand dollars is still a lot of money to me. I know it's not to a lot of the players out there, um, but it is for me. And it's going to be a factor. But I think I have enough, enough chips that I can continue to play my game, especially with my table draw. I saw a lot of the players on my table didn't have any chips, which is really nice. So I can continue to play my game without putting my entire stack at risk and. Um, so I hope it doesn't affect it that much because uh, I do want to pound the bubble pretty hard. But if I said it wasn't going to be in my mind when, the, when we get down to 650 players or so, I'd be lying. So um, hopefully I can get through the the money bubble and then start to and forget about it completely. So. Well, I think it'll it'll come quickly. Mm -hmm. And then once once you're in the money, you know they're paying what 620. You said mm -hmm. they'll be down 400. You know right, right away, yep. which is always how it works. And mm -hmm. I don't know what the payouts are, but I, I presume they start to uh, you know they start to increase quite nicely around that point. Mm -hmm. So um, so what's your plan after the World Series? You still have another year left of college, right? And uh, 
obviously if you win the main event, you know, you're or you know, cash for seven <laughs> figures, maybe you'll have a different outlook. But assuming you you know, you only cash for a couple hundred thousand, mm -hmm. you know, what's what's gonna be your uh your twelve to twenty four month plan? Oh god. Um well this next month, I have another month before school starts up. I'm probably just going to be playing poker pretty much full time. I think there's, and then uh, in September there's the Poker Stars the World Championship of Online Poker or whatever. I'll be playing almost all those events, and then school starts up. And I I don't play much during school just because the time is it, like it's too hard to commit a bunch of t a bunch of time during the school year. So from September through April, end of April again, I'm probably not going to be playing all that much. Uh, I'll definitely be playing like Sundays and a few days during the week, but it's not going to be nothing like the volume I put in during uh, the summer months. And I and really don't have an opportunity to travel at all for like the bigger live events. So I mean, it it, it kind of sucks that I have to put my poker playing on hiatus a little bit for the nine months I'm in school. Um, but I can do it, and uh, once I graduate, then it'll be all poker from then on. So. Um, so you're you're planning on playing poker professionally after college? I will for a little bit until I decide what I want to do. But once I get my degree, I don't want to play poker forever. I don't want to play poker for a living. Maybe for a few years after college, maybe go travel a little bit. Um, but I definitely want to get a serious... I, I want to go into the working world eventually and play poker for fun as opposed to play poker for a living. All right. Well, Scott, best of luck in the uh, rest of the main event. Hopefully you... You know, go back to L.A. with a couple million bucks in your pocket. That'd be nice. Eight million, actually, would be very nice. All right, well, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Just glad to have you here. Appreciate it. Well, that's it for today's episode of Stacking Chips. Make sure to tune in tomorrow and throughout the World Series for more strategy talk, discussion, interviews, and more right here on Card Player TV. And keep those emails coming in to stackingchips at cardplayer.com. From John Pokertrip Friedberg. And uh, Scott S.C. Trojans Freeman. We're out of here. Good luck, and I will see you guys tomorrow.